We're given a lot of test grades, I'm sure. Yes, but they were just <laughs> and righteous on my part. Uh, and they didn't always have cliff notes, sadly for them. Um, yeah, we. that is an interesting tale that uh, Frank was just speaking of about. And we'll get to that particular situation, but let's face it, in the history of bigotry and intolerance, there's always that feeling that... Uh, God can sort out everything, and there is always the right way, my way, and the wrong way, your way. So we will see this in particular in the question of heresy. Heresy is, of course, a kind of eyes in the beholder, because we know that I could declare a certain view correct and yours to be heretical, and that makes the difference between black and white, right and wrong, no gray. We remember heresies from the early days of Christianity. You remember when the creed came about, and those who deviated from that creed were declared heretics, and most of this had to do with theology. But now it will be a question of institutions and questioning the authority of that institution, which will be more a concern of, quote-unquote, heresies. A lot of this has to do with the changes in the medieval world, as you can see by the points I've tried to make. We clearly know, and we'll talk more about this next term, the incredible growth in the medieval world. People were living longer and more people were surviving. And that seems good up to a point. As long as you can pay for them, as long as you can feed them. Uh, and we understand at the same time that there are more and more people who can read. Now, I make it clear that this is biblical literacy because there's not a lot of reading for any other non-religious purpose except for the use of, I guess, business, so the idea of biblical literacy will be very important as more and more people are able to read the Bible for themselves. It's hard to understand unless we realize that there's still an elite who's doing the reading, I would think. I can't read the mass of people who are out reading the Bible. Uh, you know, I used to tell students about, now make sure when you check into your motel, you check for your Gideon's Bible, and then they look at me now and, oh, you know, but, you know, in the day, we remember when the Gideon's Bible was right there by the bedside. Uh, and the idea, of course, of Bibles being that prevalent was to understand that they knew enough Latin, St. Jerome's Vulgate version, that they could read it. Now, we're talking about the masses, but we're talking about that particular group of what we call upper middle class, maybe. This biblically literate class then, of course, understandably, comes up with the differences between the reality they see around them and the great amount of discussion in the Gospels about how to leave a righteous life. And they find the two in serious disagreement. 
So the result is they can't say, well, sometimes we're not like we ought to be. But they take it out of course on the institutional church. That is to say, as the church has evolved over the centuries, like every institution, like our university, institution means administration. And administration, dare I say it, proliferates. There are more and more. It grows. Like we have in the South, kudzu. <laughs> and there are, you check if you think I'm lying. Oh, I mean, there, there, are, there are lots of folks, just lots of them. And that, of course, is the state that the medieval church comes up with. And that's why I refer to it as papal and other ecclesiastical institutions. It is absolutely amazing. All of the figures, people that are needed to keep it going. And that may not have been true in the early days. I'm sure it was. Think back in Charlemagne's time. They couldn't have even imagined what all that would be like. And now, by the 12th, 13th century, we're seeing all of these institutions grow. And of course, people will ask me, does that mean everybody's real religious? I said, no, but I said they want good jobs and security, and you got that with the church position. They'd had, I guess, a dental plan that would have given you that. But the, basically, the idea is that this is huge, and it is a very much part of this literate lay complaint. The complaint, Christ preached a message of humility and simplicity, and what's all this? So the church has a problem on its hand, because obviously they're not all going to run out and say, I want to be a hippie. I mean, it's, if I may use that term, uh, some of you will re remember those people. But the idea being that it's not always possible. And so the church's theologians are going to have to do some explaining and get things down so that people can understand a cliff notes as it were for theology yes <laughs> we're thinking can you imagine you could just have a fold out there that you could take it with you and show it to others and uh corrupt them with that uh, <laughs> yes oh, shocked but Let's see what they will do. And of course, 12, 15 is the big day. So again, I try to give you as few dates as possible, but sometimes I have to. I try to keep it at a minimum, but there's some occasion. You say, we already know that because of Magna Carta. I know you do, and I'm happy for you. But I'm telling you, there's more to 1215 than just there. The Fourth Lateran Council, yes, as every good Catholic should know. Uh, and this, of course, was Innocent III's triumph. Now, unknown to him, he was going to die next year. Uh, which was a bummer, but uh, probably a case of uh, high stress. Uh, I mean, 1198 to 1216, he was just 37 when he became Pope. And I'm thinking, are they old? Yep, one taking good care of himself. So out he goes in 1216. 
But boy, at that fourth Lateran Council, they were all coming and bowing and scraping. And, and guess who was there? The Patriarch of Constantinople. Some foot kissing. You say, really? Yes, because this was after the Fourth Crusade. So we got one of ours in that position. Ours being Catholic. You said, where's the Orthodox? Bye-bye. We're not in right now. The Patriarch of Antioch. Antioch and Jerusalem. We're both controlled by the Catholics at this point. So Innocent is sort of beside himself, ecstatic, because they seem more like a global thing. I'm truly the vicar of Christ. And do you all agree? And then, of course, everybody's going to go, yes. I mean, there are no Greeks there that are going to give us any trouble and misbehave and speak out of term and say, well, I'm not so sure about that. Uh maybe we're all kind of equal. No, you're subservient. I mean, we're all equal, but some are more equal than others. And I'm the most equal in, he in the room. And the sycophants will say, yes, definitely. This Fourth Lateran Council is getting down to it, and it is like the Council of Trent. Or Vatican One, Vatican II. We all know, those of you Catholic will know about how transformative these events can be. You might not think so at first, if some of you remember the beginnings of Vatican II, but it worked and it did make very great changes. And as far as the Fourth Lateran Council, and the point of this talk is that thanks to the Fourth Lateran Council, there's going to be a specific definition and understanding of the sacraments, of the responsibilities and significance of the priest, all of the various aspects of the Catholic faith. Because in the past, it was sort of like loose. Nothing was too specific. I mean, there was an understanding, but you could kind of elasticize it, let us say, to fit into situations where maybe, but if you have a, a special girlfriend maybe you all can date and <laughs> there can be a little uh pastor to be and you know junior <laughs> junior priest and you know and all of that and you say wait a minute that's not the way it's supposed to be and then they say you're exactly right uh, and all of these various aspects will become how do we say it? Black and white nowadays. Very clear, very defined. And if you don't like it, then you're in the wrong area. Uh, the definition of marriage, that will be very, very clearly defined. They even use examples. What if there was a, oh, they use the example of a Muslim who was disguised as a Christian how he would go about doing that, I'm not sure I know, but that, that doesn't break the hypothetical story. But he goes and he courts this really nice Christian woman. And she says, oh, baby, I think I love you. Um, and so, of course, they go to the priest and they're married. Well, after they get back from the honeymoon, you know, they get back back from and they're driving back and to deal with the bills and the mortgage and all that and then she says you know baby i love allah i didn't tell you about my Quran. oh no 
Well, Fourth Labyrinth Council says that's not a real marriage. Yeah. So now we've solved that problem. I know that's kept us up at night, but that it's fascinating to think that was never a marriage in the first place. No divorce court for you. You're out of there because the marriage was based on the lie. So we've solved that. No more. All of this then was explaining sacraments. Uh, all, all kind of really strange situations. If a student ran me down, uh, I know that would be unfortunate, but it, it, I've, I've had some interesting encounters, shall we say, with fenders. And so you <laughs> understand life is good, but let us say that one got me and I'd never been baptized. Then, I always give the example, somebody could rush out with a cup from Wendy's. They used to be at Wendy's over there. On, well, I guess it's still there. Right there on Gay, you could come out there. And you could baptize me in the name of the Trinity. And I, that would work, even though you were a Hindu. And in you know that while, because they don't know what a Hindu is at that time. But <laughs> the point is that they make that very clear that baptism is instrumental to salvation, and I can get it at that, you know, last stop, cause the emergency and go get there in time. So uh, I want that one on my head. So there you go. And you think, who thinks up this? A lot of pe theologians... And believe you me, it's not fast either. They have some serious meetings, long meetings. And all of this is to say they work out the sacraments, the priests, and all of the authorities and innocent and his entourage, the cardinals, are coordinating it because, of course, he's the vicar of Christ. And if you don't like it, then you are trouble. You got big trouble. We don't have trouble. You got trouble. Because you are, I call them dissidents here, because you are in disagreement with the fundamentals of the church. And who says what those fundamentals are? We do. You don't. You follow what you have been told. And that's, of course, as in many cases, a question of authority. Where does the authority lie? Well, that's 1215 going on into 1216. And, of course, there will be further councils that will deal with all of these issues. But dissent is definitely not welcomed here. There is not an issue of, well, everybody has a right to an opinion and all of that. I don't think that we're about that. We are about the authority coming from God to his vicar. And yes, they will use the title vicar of Christ in uh, future popes. So we'll go from vicar of Christ to vicar of God. So, um, I don't guess you can get much higher than that, right? So now, what about heresies? Believe you me, Innocent III knew about them, and he was prepared to deal with them, and he did. Now, people ask me sometimes, is a Muslim a heretic? No, because it, it's too different. A uh, heretic, I think, has to be a dissenting Christian view. So Jewish people or Muslims or other faiths are just there. That doesn't mean we accept them, but they're not heretics. Heretic means you have 
a deviant Christian view. And we've tried to help you, but you didn't accept it. So you're a double loser because you have the wrong view. <laughs> that happens. And we tried to help you. And you turned us down. You and he patrol, as we would say in the South. But all of this, we can see starting with the clear example of the institutionalization of the church and understanding that when you have all these administrators and authority figures, and of course they're all on top salaries and uh, all the rest, and we understand they're bucking for promotions, and you think, oh, someday I'm going to be a bishop, and you know, you're some like young uh, priest, you you know, you're a pastor, you think, yeah, but I'm not going to be here forever, it's Saint. Saint so and so's, I'm going to be running the whole diocese. You know, I mean, everybody's very ambitious, perhaps, because, and there are a lot of, I know you'll be shocked if you're from Alabama, there are a lot of nepotists. I know you're horrified, <laughs> but there was a lot of nepotism going around. Yes. The nepotism. Oh well, Illinois has it too. I know. Oh, no, you know, you know nothing of nepotism in Illinois. But the idea of like junior here, I want him to get my job. You say, well, should there really even be a junior? Well, he was a boo boo. I know, I know it happens. And uh, but I want, I want junior to be uh, the bishop, and. Says she can be the abbess, and you think, but what if she's not called to that life? She'll get used to it, <laughs> and she can study hard, and maybe some medieval notes. Yeah, she can learn, catch up with the other students. The idea, though, is ordinary Christians can easily lapse into heresy when they compare their reading of Scripture. Because no longer do you have... Some of you all remember when I talked about the allegorical interpretation of Scripture. Because that's what most people would know. I mean, it's like they wouldn't take all this literally. You know, the stories about what does it mean, the eye of the... Uh, the eye of the camel and all the rest of it. And so now they read it for themselves and they're going, well, golly. <laughs> you know, that sort of naivete. You might, I don't mean to be uh, putting down, but I'm just saying there's a sense that they see this great structure and they say, how can all this exist? And yet, the message upon which it was based was uh, one of simplicity and love and all the rest. The idea of chorus means that, even though, remember it's in Latin, we don't have vernacular Bibles yet, but there's enough reading going on in the Vulgate version that I guess these groups of literate people will begin to talk among themselves and question. I, I mean, I don't know if you would do it so much publicly, like have a forum, like fight, uh, like the bishop, I don't, I don't think we're ready for that. But I do think people may have questioned among themselves some of the authority that the church possessed, um, and of course, comparing this with their interpretation of scripture, because that will be very important, especially when you read the gospels. And you understand it. Now, 
This will also have to do with the question of authority. I love that word commune. Some of you remember we talk about communes during the uh, French Revolution and the commune of Paris in the 19th century, 1800s. And, um, but this is not so much some sort of proto-Marxist <laughs> situation as it is the idea of like an urban council of probably presidents of the Rotary Club, you know, that sort of thing. And you think they're not very dangerous. Well, no, I mean, they are, I mean, these people are chamber of commerce types. So they are, they are high and mighty, but you ask a bishop or you ask a nobleman about that and they're going like, yeah, those people need to stay in their place. They're acting mighty high and mighty. So communes, what we would call, I guess, upper middle class, the bourgeois, they are beginning to express themselves and the theory goes that that combined with literacy and some reading of the scripture will make them. Why should the church have all this lucre? We should be having the lucre. And we'll give a tithe to the church or something, and then they they can live like Jesus did, you know, that kind of thing. So there will be questions about that and I don't think, though, unless you ever heard anything different, I mean, these people are threatening democracy or something like that. I think they want to keep folks quiet and behave. But this is just another sort of group of people who want to exert their authority and control. And they read the Bible, but they want the churchmen to know their position. And at the same time, they want to read the Bible. So you're going to have conflict because the church does not intend to obey any lay person. Yuck. So you got a question there. Now, heresies themselves, it, again, the only definition that I think we need here is just to say it's a Christian belief that is in conflict with that of the official church. It's all you need. So that takes them all into account because the church's view is going to be more and more closed. And it's not going to, well, maybe that's right, or maybe this is right. Whatever you feel comfortable with, whatever helps get you through the night, no. Uh, there is the right way, and then there's your way, which is the wrong way, because you're the big H. So that, as you can see, is how they are in the ranks of heretics. I don't think otherwise you can necessarily wrap them all in and say this group believes this or this group believes that, because that's the way it was. We'll see some that are milder than others that are, as we used to say, far out. Uh, but let us start by seeing what they do. They challenge the church's understanding of the Bible. And of course, they are very certain about who the real Christians are. Uh, how do they know? Well, we're the only ones who had the baptism. And you say, but I'm waiting to get mine when the student hits me while I'm crossing the street. No, uh, 
you'll still be a loser because you weren't baptized the right way. Uh, again, it's amazing. We're in a special club and you're not in it. Well, you think, well, I'm a Catholic. We're the, we're the top. No, you're not. <laughs> you're all going to hell. Uh, the whole bunch. And guess what? We are the we're the real ones. We're the God's school. And that's the ones, the adult baptism. And, you know, you turn to the church, and the church is going to go, what? That's only at last minute. Like me with that Wendy's cup. That's, I mean, I was, you know, I've got some serious purgatory time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, hard labor. I'm going down. But that is the idea uh, that some of these groups have, the adult baptism, and we're special and you're not. And not only are you not special, but you are a damned loser. Oh, damn can be taken two ways, right? Yeah. So there you are. Gosh, that seems hard. Well, I'm telling you, we're not in the enlightenment. Everybody thinks they're right. And these folk don't have any power, though, do they? They just say this to each other, I guess, during cult meetings when they get together at their philosophy club. You know, we're the only ones who are saved. And they go, yeah, too bad about all those damn losers. Yes, because that means the rest, the rest of the world, right? I mean, you know, it's not like you got to have that sense. Uh, we're heretics and we're proud <laughs> because those wretched Catholics. That's the idea. Whether they're going to do this, I mean, whether they'll come out and do it in public, I'm a heretic and I'm proud. I, 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 I always wondered about that. I don't think you'd do it. On the other hand, if you have secret meetings, uh, you get together, I think that could be a little suspicious. Wouldn't you think? I mean, if you were getting together, people could see you. Oh, Bible study. Well, maybe I'll come over and see you with your Bible study. <laughs> what kind of Bible you're using? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, obviously, they're going to denounce institutions. No monks or nuns need apply. You might find that surprising, but that particular style of life is very an antithetical to uh, heretics as a rule. In fact, I've never heard of heretical groups that supported monasticism or any of the rest. They are more or less for um, families and so forth. But the idea of celibacy, mm -mm. Uh, some are supportive of a no war policy, so we wouldn't need all these weapons to go kill folks. But they are small groups. I mean, let's face it, they are not running whole countries. They tend to be small groups, and they might say, Beat your swords uh, into plowshares, whatever. That idea of peace and so forth. Now, that's good for you to say, but you're not king of anything. You're just Joe Schmo. I mean, so you're not anything. Uh, how well organized are they? Well, not very. We don't know a lot about them. It's not like they kept lots of records and then... Later, the Catholic Church decided to write about them. It's like the truth of the, the truth of heresy. It's like if they could get a, a hold of any of these materials, I'm sure they destroyed as much as they could. There is some interesting material from the Inquisition, and more about that later. Some of you remember I talked about a book in which a scholar of the 1970s actually examined these inquisitional records about a small town in southern France. And it was absolutely amazing because the whole town, basically, including the priest, had gone 
heretical. And they were, I mean, it was party city. I mean, it was like pretty wild. And when the, but when the Inquisition got a hold of them, no Fifth Amendment for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you saw it on Showtime. You would be shocked, horrified, uh, make a take because, of course, they're going to condemn the church and they will say, they say, now let me hear what would you have to say? You're there before the committee and this committee of church authorities will quote unquote examine you and you know, you're hardly an expert. You may have gotten your cliff notes and you have looked over it and you've got one of these plastic charters and so You've got some basics, but you're not ready to take your PhD. You understand? <laughs> so, again, you may be in trouble and you say, well, you know, you're right. I didn't really understand what I was getting into. I had a group of people and they seemed to think it was a good idea. So, I've been bad. I'm so sorry. And they would go, okay. You know, the idea being, in other words, that uh, these people are obvious in the sense that they condemn the church's teachings. How often does this occur and people slip through the cracks? Could be very often. Because the church can't watch everywhere, everybody. And there may be individuals who got through. But again, if you are true to your beliefs, it would seem to me that people would take note that you are not following the path of the institutional church. One example of somebody who was out and proud was Pierre Waldock of Valdez. Incidentally, for those who've read the book, there is a town in North Carolina that was supposedly founded by people who followed this belief. I find that absolutely fascinating. Valdez, I think it's called, or oh, Valdez. North Carolina, I think it's near where that big furniture business used to be. It must be in the Winston-Salem area. But, and they united with, believe it or not, the PCUSA. So, that's a little contemporary background of these people from, as you see, Lyon, the major city of France, way over there in the east, southeast, northern Italy, and founded by Waldo. And these Waldensians, following his teachings, believe that to be, and many of you, who read the Gospels will know the story of the wise young ruler and will understand, of course, the significance of the wise young ruler not being able to give up his wealth. So Waldo's going to do it, take the plunge. And the idea was, oh, in some of the stories, he uh, more or less goes to his wife and she says, I want my community property. And then you can do what jolly well you want to, but I'm taking the stocks and bonds. Then you can um, fly the coop. So the idea is though that he gave away all that he had to the poor. And then he and his followers, and I always think it's very interesting that there were followers. They said, well, that's all very nice because he's probably just going around helping people. And 
helping the people of Lyon and other places, setting up a soup kitchen. You say, well, that's great, you know, uh, all community things. Remember, they haven't got a, a large welfare system back in the day, did they? So how can this picture be wrong? Well, it can be wrong because Waldo would not do this within the confines of the church. And he criticized, presumably, the bishops or other people from having those big palaces and saying, you ought to be out here working with me and doing all those things. And, of course, he's called in by the uh, bishop. And they said, now, Pierre, you know, you are a lay person. You are not a clergyman. So you do what we say. And so if you're going to have a kitchen or you're going to do this, that, and the other, you'll do it within the jurisdiction of the church. Because see, Waldo was not only giving away, but he was preaching. And that is, as we say to the children, a no-no. So did Peter Waldo need a time out? Yes, he did. <laughs> because that was, oh boy. The idea of, you know, it's like the church authorities viewed him you know, that was nice. You want to give away. That's great. Probably get a tax credit for that. <laughs> you know, we get that. That's wonderful. But you think you're like one of us. Well, you're not. You're a lousy layman. Oh. Alliteration. So there you go. And you're thinking, well, I'm as good as you are. We're all God's children. Yes, but we're in hierarchy. And you are not top. You are just some bourgeois. Yeah. You may have been in the Rotary Club, Chamber of Commerce. We get that, but that doesn't get you up there. So you do what we say, and he says, may not. So he's in a lot of trouble if he had stayed around, but he was busy, I'm sure, traveling. And yeah, because the Waldensian communities began to spread throughout the area. And as I say, ended up in of all places, North Carolina, which is pretty wild. But you'll be interested, I mean, I found it fascinating to read about this church in North Carolina because... They are Presbyterians and very involved in uh, social and economic causes of today. But they're very proud of their connection with the um, original Waldensians, and I found it fascinating because, I mean, I'm sure there's still groups that connect with that in Italy or Germany, France. But to think of North Carolina, I was very surprised. Now we come to the Albigensians. I love this map. See Spain down there. See the Mediterranean Sea. And you see that area in mustard, which is essentially the area that would have been, as the Catholic Church would have said, infected by this uh, particular large spread heresy. Not the Albigensians, we can deal with that. But this movement of Albigensianism, so-called, because of this particular area, you can see, and many of you have been here, I'm sure, 
and you'll be aware of how beautiful all this is. And you can see various places you've been to. And as you look at the map, you see Montpellier, Carcassonne, and other places there that are put in block letters, capitalist. And that's, I assume, because they were major centers. You see that FOI over there, F-O-I-X. That's interesting to me because of the fact that that's where they based this book about the small town in this little remote village and everybody began following the heresy and how through the records of the Inquisition, they were able to determine a lot about what they believed and what kind of aberrations they might have followed in their religious and other practices, not just religion, because we know that this particular uh, belief is so strong in some groups that will, it will affect things. Now, these are the Cathari, as Frank mentioned, Manichaeans, if you will. They've been called a lot of things, none of it good, because these are not pro- Albigensian sources. They are Catholic. So this is rated X, okay? Nay, triple X, yeah. Uh, this is not for young folks. This is for serious folks because this embodies the evil, even though in the area, apparently, some Catholics got along with them in a kind of like, hi, Albigensian neighbors, hope you're doing well. That seems a little Andy and Opie to me, a little too Mayberry, speaking of North Carolina. I, I'm very surprised, but the theory is that it's like live and let live, that the Albigensians were in an area where the Catholic Church was not as strong as it might have been. And when you were talking about places like, well, you see Norbonne, some of you will know the city of Toulouse. I don't know why, but I have right up there. Um, there's some beautiful places there. I'll say they uh, down there in southern France. And Apparently, in the light of the city and the sort of tendency of officials is to allow this to go on, which seems surprising, that they manage, these Albigensians manage to come out and do what they believed. And you say, well, kind of like Methodists are bad to. No, no, I think this is a little stronger than that. How do you explain it? Well, I don't, but it's like maybe using your favorite soup recipe because it's got a little of this and a little of that. And you do you see Christian Zoroastrianism? And Manichaeanism, and a dash of this, and a tablespoon of that. And you're like, how can they come up with that? Well, that's very interesting, I guess. As people travel about, going from east to west, they pick up a new idea, and they say, well, you know, this would be pretty good. Some of you watch those cooking networks and you know how that is. You say, well, I never thought about putting that in. So it would appear that by the time it reached France, <laughs> it had developed that way because they're not some 
heretical clearinghouse. Dial one eight hundred if you have questions. If you want to form your own heresy, you know it's like that. Have you ever thought about that? Say, well, we were thinking of setting up a chapter here, but uh, you have to call national and ask. Yeah, we want to. We want to try out for full fledged chapter. Well, we'll send people in and help you with that. No, I mean it's like these people must have gone in. I guess you call them missionaries of sorts. Hey, you want to be one of us? I don't know. Maybe so. We can talk behind closed doors. And that's apparently the way this group, these Catholics, they come about with some Christianity. But believe you me, as we'll soon see, he's hardly all Christian. Because it is dualistic. We know Christianity is not dualistic. Christianity comes, as does Islam, from Judaism. But dualism, like Zoroastrianism, means there's a distinct and separate evil and good. And they're duking it out. And it's a little hard sometimes to see which side's going to win. Well, of course, in the three major world religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, there's no doubt. But in this one, we know that the good will ultimately prevail. But meanwhile, it's going on in the world, and it's going on in you. So it's dual. So there's a total struggle. The good versus the evil. The spiritual versus the physical or material. And for Jews and Christians, the Old Testament versus the New Testament. And that's an interesting little twist, isn't it? That Albigensians actually went through, so the Christians believe, went through scripture to figure out that the Old Testament, and you know the stories of violence and fighting and this and that, the other, and the remember the Old Testament gods when folks act ugly to the children of Israel, they get in a lot of trouble. Remember that? So you may remember that from Bible school. And so you get the idea that's one version, and it's the bad version. But when we turn to the New Testament God, that's the good God. So these two are Duke and it out. So that's how you have it. And so the figures of the Old Testament are evil, wicked, dark, and I guess satanic. Whereas the New Testament figures led by Christ represent light and truth and righteousness. Now, if you say that, go to a big Catholic clerical meeting, they're in downtown Toulouse, I think that would be trouble. Okay, I don't think they would say, well, that's interesting, yeah. I'm glad <laughs> you brought that up. Uh, maybe we could have a panel discussion on that note. <laughs> think that, oh no, I think you will be resting in a cell before long, yes. Yeah. I think that you can understand though, and again, when I've always tried to explain Persians, Zoroastrianism, and the struggle of the two within and without ourselves, I mean, within the battle of evil versus uh, good within us, and then, of course, evil versus good in the world. So, and there's very little gray here. I mean, everything is, yeah, pretty. I mean, we happen to be in the body, 
and that can be inconvenient at times, but we understand why that's important. And just when we were thinking, no, yes, they actually have that reincarnation because a lot of us are not going to be ready for the final round, so we got to come back. And, you know, you used to say, oh, well, that's great. You really think so? Do you want to be a child again and all those diseases? I don't think so. It's not easy being a kid. So, yeah, uh, over and over until you get it right. According to this group, and so the best thing, according to the Kalvari, is to live the very, very best life you can so you don't have to come back. Because the idea is eventually you'll get it right and you'll be saved. So you want to be pure, but golly, is it tough to be pure? In order to be pure, it helps to be a vegan, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> so no steak for you. Okay. Not even chicken. Okay. Not even deboned. Uh, and no burgers. So all of that is denied you. Uh, and of course, why do you not want to have the meat? It's because of course. You don't want to take anything that lives. And you say, well, that sounds like a variety of Hinduism. I'm telling you, whatever could possibly come about, they've got it. So you are thinking about reproduction. Well, don't think about it, okay? <laughs> that is taboo, a serious no-no. And you're thinking, oh, it's all about evangelism. Well, that's good, too. But a lot of you are not ready to give up on reproduction. So you keep going with your sexual activities. But if you want to be, you know, a valedictorian, no burgers, no sex. We've got a strict set of rules. You're thinking this will be really, really tough. Well, yeah, that's what makes you uh, kind of uh, summa cum laude. I mean, you will be at the, you'll be at the top. Is a matter how how on the top will you be? Well, you'll be one of the perfects. You can strut around and tell everybody, yeah, you know, I'm a perfect. And so what does that make you? Well, you're a follower. And you say, we wish you all the best. Yeah, yeah, I know you're having chicken tonight. You got a date at the Golden Cherry. I get that. But you are basically... Not one of the perfects. I know. I'm really jealous. Don't be jealous. That's wrong. But <laughs> you really need to straighten out. Because the way you straighten out, and this will be tough, you have one sacrament. And again, much of this is known through Inquisition records. So it's kind of interesting. It's not like... You know, like some of those books you see sometimes, like an Albigensian reveals all the best told to, you know, like inquiring minds want to know. It's not like there's anything of that sort. This basically comes from inquisitorial records. And the idea is that when you become a perfect, you can't go back. I mean, you're there. So, if you sneak a burger or something like that, you go out, mm, you are really heap of trouble because you reject what's carnal 
and you receive the one and only sacrament, which means consolation, consolamentum, and you cross that bridge, if I may say, cross the Rubicon, if I may use an old cliche, and you don't go back and say, could I just have one cheeseburger for old time's <laughs> sake? God, mm, that moist. Oh, and think, oh, that bun. Mm. I mean, yeah. And you know, it's behind you. So you say, I think I need a retake of my console mentor. I'm sorry, there are no retakes. And according to these records, many people who were receiving the consolamentum had gotten a report that they were near death. So it seemed like a real good idea. It seemed like a good idea to get that consolamentum. The doctor said, well, you've just got a few days. And so you say, yep, I don't need any more burgers. I'm just going to get that. Wow, well, well, I'm still thinking about burgers. <laughs> but no. I get the consolamentum because I won't be uh, running around much longer. So you get it. And the doctor, oops, that was in somebody else's EKG. You're doing great. And so what does that? Yeah, I know that would be bad. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, according to these accounts, it means that maybe you can commit suicide because uh, you don't want to come back. It's like you pretty much ended sex, burgers, and all that you enjoy. So the idea is, is that really true? Well, I don't know. But it does seem they told some pretty wicked stories about before you become one of the perfects, you say, gee, I guess I've got some um, interest in being carnal. So let's be carnal because maybe next year or two, I'm going to get the console I'm into, but while I'm eating the burgers, let's go to the motel. So you understand, yeah, I know, I know, cheesy. The idea being, though, you understand that the consolamentum will take care of all that. And I'll be eating, what, asparagus and broccoli all the time? I don't know, whatever it is. Lots of salad, lots of salad, no dressing. So all of that, and you say it does seem a little odd, well, I agree. But again, there's no like clearing house for their theological beliefs or some sort of, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like a little of this, a little of that, and stir it all up in theology soup. But again, if this is an account that's passed down by the Inquisition, it's hard to believe they were saying, Gosh, we want to have nice things to say about them. I mean, I mean, they loved each other and they meant well. No, they are awful people. They are the devil's children. And may they all rot and burn. So, but they did flourish at one point. And again, if the accounts are true, they were living around Catholics and more or less in a sense of acceptance. If you believe what the official Catholic Church was saying at the time. Now, when the church realized, and that is to say particularly the Pope, Innocent III, realized how this group was spreading in southern France. He sent in what should we call the missionaries or people to discuss 
their beliefs. And we'll talk more about them later. But at this point, one of them was actually a citizen, that is a papal representative. And that was not acceptable to Innocent III. He had said, now I gave them a chance. I'd hope they would be, see, they're wrong, but they didn't. So now I think we need to do something more drastic. So that will lead to this, uh, and that word is Albigensian crusade. As you see by the dates, it started during Innocent III's time, but went on long after he was dead because it would take so long to bring it to an end. One of the people, and we'll look at the map in a minute, one of the people who was leading this was actually the Count of Toulouse. Was he one himself? He might as well have been, this is kind of what they would call guilt by association. Um, did you ever know or did you have friends who were part of them? Well, I'd rather not say. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, we could make a series about this. But the idea being that Raymond of Toulouse had to take the rap for it. You tolerated them. Are you saying you did? Well, no, I don't I don't think I better say anything right now. Huh. I think I better talk to my counsel. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. We could have a series, I say. And so Raymond of Toulouse, it, he really gets the um, rep for this, that he should have been responsible and not allowed this. And they were flourishing and conducting themselves in ways that are very inappropriate in a Catholic environment, you know, that all of that. And of course, this led, I love this painting, because boy, he looked like, ooh, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> and so he doesn't look like, oh, I love you. I love you. We have our differences, but give me a big hug. I don't think so. You're catching it, and you're getting it, and it'll hurt. But I love you very much. I mean, it's tough love. <laughs> so he had uh, that vicar had some tough love, as you can see. So that's our innocent. And who is he preaching to? He's preaching to the nobles of Paris. All of the area of France, I told you there's no nationalism at this time. So it's clear that these folks think they're quote-unquote French, and they're going to the South because they don't view that as being French. And of course, the idea is these areas need to be brought into obedience to the faith. And part of that means we've got some real estate transactions. <laughs> and the real estate transactions are going to involve the property of these people in Southern France, or what we call Southern France, by the really devout sons of the church who are in Northern France. So that's interesting to me that this becomes in many ways a real estate kind of transaction. The map will show you in this Albigensian crusade, how these uh, troops will get down in the area. And you see, I hate to reach over further. 
Caucasus and all of these areas of southern France there in green. And the bloodshed and violence and so forth is Frank indicated with people saying something like God can sort them out and that sort of thing means that as in all wars of religion, there is terrible violence, but violence that I suppose warriors feel is justified by the seriousness of the offense committed by the so-called wrongdoers. And in this case, the Albigenses. Now, as I say, Innocent III by no means lived to see the end of it, but clearly the Albigensians were not prepared for major war. I suppose people like Raymond of Toulouse and other Catholic leaders in the South had to bear the pain because they had been friendly to these Albigensians. But yes, it was bloody and destructive. This shows the illustration of the poor folks going out and led by the Catholic caucus on uh, Gosh, I had some people who actually told me about going there and to Carcassonne and see where the fortress was, where they were. That, it was amazing to hear about. I've never been there, but it's interesting to imagine how terrible that would have been. Now, I'm sure there are other stories where Muslims or Jews or others have suffered similar abuse, but this being such a large area of uh, Cathars would have led these Catholic forces to be very violent and do so at a huge scale. So it was a terrible event in this part of France. Um, the result, of course, will be the end of the Qatar movement officially. But as I tell you, it went on, not for Raymond of Toulouse, however. He and his family were removed. That would be taken over and ruled by a brother, remember St. Louis, Louis the Ninth? His brother uh, will get that area. In other words, it will truly be a transformation by new rulers. All of this is to say that there are going to be some great transformations. Does it mean the movement is destroyed? No. The movement will go on, but the book that I was telling you about comes from the early 14th century, long after this. So obviously these people, if they were going into little towns and communities and Maybe if some Catholic leader were passing through, everybody would go through the motions of, oh, we're going to go to Mass, or we, oh, and we're excited about the bishop's visit for baptism. And then the minute he's out of town, we go back to our wicked ways, damnable ways. Yeah, because it seems very, very odd and I think I told you about the area called Foix, F-O-I-X, that area over there, rife with heresy. But it's not necessarily true that, you know, they weren't out and proud. It's like they were more or less doing this amongst themselves. And then somebody snitched. <laughs> yeah, and they got caught. It always happened. 
there's some little Catholic running around. I'm going to turn you in. You know, it's like you were bad in high school. You probably had some little uh, teacher friend who could report you. Not you. I'm sure you were virtuous, but I, there yeah. were, but you may have known people who were not. And so we know about them. Now, the mendicant friars are fascinating because they are the Catholic Church's force to combat heresy. Would they have existed in any way? I suspect so. I don't think we need to have heresy to have friars, but I think it helps. It <laughs> means that people who dedicate themselves in a monastic way but they do so in a special and different way. You know, if I were going to give a whole talk on the history of monasticism, don't worry, I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm, I know, I know, I know, scary, isn't it? Scary. But I could, I could hold that over on you. Yeah. Confusions, Cistercians. I know you get excited when I say words like that, but it's like there's so many ways to go monastic if you if you really want to, and we won't even need to leave. We could just hang out here overnight and start talking. I wouldn't get to Clooney until oh hours, but basically the idea is that there are many many ways that Benedict's ideas would expand, vary in ways that maybe don't seem so significant. But the way here is that mendicant friars would, in essence, not be confined to a monastery because the monastery was too confining. They wanted to do the will of God, but they wanted to do it in an open world. And we know that by this point, there was enough development of urban centers that these people had plenty to do, particularly Franciscans. Now, they followed lives of poverty and chastity. Again, if we've all read Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales, we know that sometimes we can have a little rotten fruit, but that happens. But I'm just saying that idealistically, <laughs> Everyone is following the path of poverty and chastity. But they're not following necessarily that idea of stability. They're not there copying manuscripts. The idea is they get out. And they do. And they do without property and they're called mendicant because presumably they are without funds and so they are in essence making their own funds creating what they need as they help the helpless and that is their purpose originally Now, I mentioned Dominic, Dominicanes, as you know, hounds of the Lord, or dogs, girls. And the idea of being a Dominican might seem like the idea is you are straying from the flock. Ruff, ruff. So, you know what we're going to do? Bring you back. We may have to snap at you. <laughs> but you will have your, your notes to go back to. And 
you'll see I'm right. The idea of Dominic, who apparently was a brilliant Spaniard, that's what they always say, that this guy did really well on GREs and SATs. And so, yeah, he would have uh, done very well. And he was very, very upset by what was going on in southern France. And he loved the popes. So he decided in his intellectuality, he would show these heretics or would-be heretics how wrong they were. And he did this with, in the stories they always say, his brilliant explanation of the church, of scripture. And so you were some troublemaker and you're trying to infect us with your heresy. And so I'm a Dominican and you know what I'm going to do? Let me tell you something, brother, and you're going to go, yeah, well, I'm going to tell you, no. I'm speaking for God, and you don't, damn you. And then I'll talk you down and maybe have to wrestle you down because you're awful. <laughs> and I will I will explain the proper way, and you go, wow, you're so smart. And I'm such a loser. And so that is the idea the Dominicans would have the theological wherewithal and people would look like gosh I almost fell for those heretics came so close but it was that hound of God burf, burf, that got me away <laughs> I'm sure you were impressed with my canine so that that idea was uh, the Dominicans of course, St. Francis was even more famous, and we see the famous stigmata, his love of animals and nature and uh, the whole idea, or the idea that would be perpetuated over the centuries, of Francis and the Franciscans as truly uh, fools for God because there was no education here. Unlike the Dominicans, we're not going out and getting PhDs in theology. We are simply going out and showing people how wonderful it is to follow the Lord. Um, even when Francis aged, Franciscans were beginning to fall away and say, you know, I love the ideas, but I really want to do a PhD. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, gosh, you mentioned all those Franciscans, how exciting it would be to want to do PhDs. Give me oral to give me death, you know, that yeah, kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I can't get enough of that education. And Francis basically sort of took a back seat during the latter years of his life. But the idea, the ideal of the Franciscanism and the idea of loving people, but I'm going to tell you, from Francis onward, there will always be obedience to the authority of the Pope. The idea of coerce in this famous medieval painting by Giotto, the great Italian medieval painter. And I love it, of course, because there is my hero, Innocent III, taking a nap. You notice he does not uh, sleep in PJs, but he's basically, he's done up just in case uh, he's needed for action. Because <laughs> I have an innocent third action figure yeah, that I'll show you next time. So, but there it's Francis, and you say, gosh, 
It looks like the ladder run is falling down. Yes, it is. And guess who's holding it up? It's Francis. So that's the, and that was only in the early 14th century when that was painted. So that's kind of an interesting concept, isn't it? Even then they understood that innocent was not capable of that kind of compassion and love. I mean, he, but he understood how to employ it for the purposes of the church. And there is some movie which would show the meeting of Innocent and Francis, which of course is strictly Hollywood, but it shows sort of Francis as a hippie and uh, Innocent is basically all done up and sitting real high on the throne. And of course, Francis is groovy and he's with all of <laughs> And all the like, yeah, 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 man, this is really a cool place. And then it's like they become really great chums, which is doubtful. I think <laughs> I think that was probably a quick interview. So yeah, this will be really nice. And thanks for stopping by. This has been really nice. But yeah, that is the idea there. And there he is. And notice who well, Innocent has a nice. See, it's nice, maybe, but no, no hair. So he didn't get saint. See, but he's not jealous. He's, he's glad that Scott Francis got one. <laughs> Sometimes you can be bitter, but he seems to have done fine. Unfortunately, the Franciscans as well as Dominicans, became involved with the Inquisition. The Inquisition means a board of inquiry. It's not exactly the horrible business it would seem and is illustrated here. Nor is it the same thing as the Spanish Inquisition, which came centuries later under Ferdinand and Isabella to deal with Muslims and Jews. Originally, it was an Italian device because other monarchs would not allow it in. And it was largely manned by Dominicans. And I say manned because there were female Dominicans and female Franciscans, but obviously they couldn't travel about, so they were confined behind closed doors, as the song was. So the idea was then, see that Dominican way on top, the individuals would be someone who were accused of heretical views. No, that's the interesting thing about it. That usually the site of a supposed execution would be enough to show people they were wrong. So it wouldn't come about. It's sort of like uh, way back centuries before it wasn't necessary to have people go through the ordeal because they could confess. They could just take the thought of it. The priest could say, you know, you'll go to hell. So, you know, you know, I talked to my lawyer, so I'm going to, uh, oh, an Alfred plea. We know what that, an Alfred plea, an Alfred plea, something. So the idea then is, of course, we don't have to burn because we have confessed. If there were execution and torture, all of it was done for people who were more or less recanters. There's nothing worse, particularly when you think of Joan of Arc. And many of us think of Joan of Arc as, for example, of being burnt. That was the idea, though, of recanting. You confess, and then you say, no. I didn't really do it. 
And then you go, well, you were given a chance. And therefore, you see what happens. Now, what does it mean if you do confess? Well, it's not going to be good, but you will live. Uh, it's hard to imagine what sort of presence they had. Yeah, so I'm not thinking that would be pretty good. But you would live in poverty because they would probably confiscate whatever you had. I'm not saying in it by any way that the Papal Inquisition was something that one would want, but I'm saying that it was useful for these people in terms of trying to discourage heresy. And we and they of course provide an amazing record for those of us who study medieval religion and those who descended from it. Thank goodness for the Reformation and the Enlightenment, because we know that great days of toleration, understanding are coming, but not to this class, because <laughs> this is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, folks. It's not meant to be, but you need worry about the next week, our last, will be dedicated to Sicily and all the wonderful Sicilians that, uh, that, that fill our lives with joy. So I'll see you all next time. Thanks to you.